Well, good morning, Springs. It is a joy to see you here, and it's a joy to see um, everyone online joining us as we worship today. I invite you to stand, if you would, and uh, as we prepare to go before the throne of God in worship, uh, I thought I would read a passage to you that just seemed really appropriate um, for all that's kind of gone on this week and something that we need to uh, be reminded of every day uh, of our lives. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Let's sing together. There we go. heart I'm tethered to. With every step, I collide with you. Like a tidal wave, crashing over me, rushing in to meet me here. Your love is fierce, like a hurricane. Surround me. 
Morning Springs Church. I'm Ashlyn Bokesh. And I'm Emily Bokesh. And today we'll be reading Romans 12 verses 9 through 16 b. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly.
guys have a seat. Good morning. To those of you with whom I am so excited to share this room, <laughs> and those who are sharing this communion time with us from a distance, thank you for joining us. We welcome you in the name of Jesus, because at his table, all are welcome. For those of us who are here, as we begin this time, I will remind you uh, that we have tables here and on the sides and also in the back so that you can stagger yourselves in appropriate social and distance yourself appropriately, but hopefully smiling through our masks. We are living in disorienting times. And cycles of change that seem to come more quickly and more frequently than ever before challenge us. Differing values and opinions on how to navigate these changes continue to create a growing chasm between those who disagree with one another. And that seems an utterly simplistic statement about the reality of our immense complexity. I stand before you this morning as a human whose heart is broken over the polarization of our communities, and I find myself struggling to find answers, desperate to find ways to be a part of the solution and careful not to contribute to division and strife. This table, the bread we will eat, the cup we will drink, this table calls us to more than individual communion with Jesus, whose broken, bloody body and victory over death provides for our restored relationship with God. This table, calls us to a kingdom in which we choose to bless our enemies instead of curse them. This table calls us to a kingdom in which empathy for both those who rejoice and weep is a requirement. This table calls us to a kingdom in which we befriend those who are not like us. This table calls us to a kingdom in which we choose humility over arrogance. This table calls us to a kingdom in which we are transformed into the image of our King, Christ Jesus. He taught that these kingdom characteristics will always feel in opposition or even upside down in comparison to the physical kingdom in which we live. May his kingdom come. May his purposes be accomplished on earth as in heaven. Would you please pray with me? God, as we remember how Jesus lived when he was on this earth, as we remember how he died, as we remember how the tomb in which he was laid did not stay, as we remember. Fill us with your spirit and transform us into his image, not only for our individual good, but for the good of our world. Let us be your light. Let us bring your peace into this dark world in which we find ourselves. We cannot do this without you. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come to the tables. Years I spent in vanity and pride Carrying on my Lord was crucified 
Knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. There your mercy and your grace was free. There your pardon multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. everything now I gladly know him as my king now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary
tender touch filled with grace faithful love endless power living flame spirits fire burning bright in the night guiding my way faithful love from above came to earth to show the father's love and i'll never be the same for i've seen faithful love face to face and Jesus is his name. Faithful love, Faithful love from, above from above came to earth to show the Father's love. And I'll never be the same for I've seen faithful love face to face and Jesus is his name Have a seat. good morning Springs Church Welcome once again in the name of Jesus Christ to all of you this morning. And if you're joining us on the live stream, I want to welcome you as well and just say again how much we miss you, how much we love you and long to be with you, but we're glad that you're joining us remotely from afar. Last week we finished Ecclesiastes talking about Hebel, talking about fleeting life lost too soon talking about Abel and blood crying out from the ground. And then the next day in Minneapolis, a black man named George Floyd was killed when an officer detained him by pushing his knee on his neck for nearly 10 minutes. And then chaos and unrest and all sorts of turmoil has been erupting all around us. And so I just wanna take one little moment this morning to lament once again, the Hebel all around us, to lament with George Floyd and his community, his family, and to commit ourselves as the body of Christ to be a people determined to do the hard work of racial reconciliation in this country, to be a people who are willing to uphold and promote and protect the precious image of God in every single human being. That's my prayer for us, church. My prayer that God would let his righteousness and his justice overflow from us like an ever-flowing stream for the sake of the world, church. That's my hope today. And today, we also begin a new sermon series. We begin together in Proverbs, Wisdom for the Journey, in chapter one, verses one through seven. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for gaining instruction in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, and equity. To teach shrewdness to the simple, knowledge and prudence to the young, Let the wise also hear and gain in learning, and the discerning acquire skill. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on us, for we are sinners. But we are sinners saved by you. Jesus, we praise your holy name this morning. We are called together, held together, by your holy name and your powerful salvation. 
We give thanks for you. We ask for the strength and the wisdom to live a life conformed to you. And it's in your precious and beautiful and wonderful name we pray all these things together. I ask you, Lord, for the gift of preaching and that this text would be illuminated in our hearing. Amen. Like most fiancés, my parents, when they got engaged, sought out premarital counseling. Not having the money or the inclination to hire an expensive therapist, they turned towards somebody in their local congregation, somebody that my dad really admired, a man named Jim Boyd, an older fellow who they decided to sit at his feet for an evening and try and soak up some wisdom for him for this journey that they were about to embark upon in marriage. So they get over to Jim's house and they start talking to him and a little ways into the conversation, Jim pulls out his uh, tobacco with pipe and he lights it up and he starts smoking and he looks to my dad and he, he says, so do you like her? And my dad says, well yeah, Jim, I, I love her. And he says, no, that's, that's not what I asked you. Do you like her? And uh, he was like, yeah, he's like, because if, if, if you love a woman without liking her, then the, the winters are long and the nights are cold and contempt comes up with the sun and on and on he kind of monologued. Well, years later, my parents were married and in their house and watching an old 1965 Civil War film starring Jimmy Stewart called Shenandoah. And they get to a scene in the movie where Jimmy Stewart's talking to his future son-in-law and he rolls a, a little bit of tobacco into a cigar and he lights it up and he says, look, Sam, uh, do you like her? <laughs> and he says, well, yeah, I, I love her. He says, uh, that's not what I asked. Do you like her? Because loving a woman without liking her, well... The winters are long and the nights are cold and contempt comes up with the sun. And my parents watch jaw agape as they realize that the wisdom they had sought out and found from Jim Boyd had been completely pilfered from a Jimmy Stewart movie from the 60s. We're in Proverbs this morning wisdom for the journey. And while I'd like to say that all of us deep down seek wisdom, that all of us want to find wisdom, I think on some level that's true, but the more I read Proverbs, the more I'm not so sure. Because in verse seven of our little section, the very end, Proverbs says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, many of us say we want to be wise. Many of us actually indeed do want to be wise. But I think there's a lot of us that aren't all that interested in wisdom because wisdom is challenging. Wisdom is upending. Wisdom can unsettle our comfortable little pleasure-seeking lives. Wisdom is a difficult task. And yet, I'm hopeful this morning because my heart and mind actually in reading Proverbs has jumped to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, where he says that God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. If we're willing, God has given us all that we need for this journey of life. And one of the gifts that God has given us is his word. And specifically this morning is the book of Proverbs. And so I'm excited to open up this book with you over the next string of weeks and with Ben and to look at the wisdom we need to walk the path of a godly life together. So let's jump right back into verse 1 in chapter 1 of Proverbs. It says, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for gaining instruction in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, and equity. 
to teach shrewdness to the simple, knowledge and prudence to the young. So I think the first thing we find in the book of Proverbs here is simply that wisdom is communal. Wisdom is communal, and I mean that in a couple different senses. The first sense is that wisdom comes to us from our community. Yes, we can find wisdom in all sorts of other places, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but primarily we receive the wisdom of God through his community. This starts by attributing things to Solomon. It starts by taking us back to the line of David, specifically to God's people Israel. That is the community through which we receive true godly wisdom is from our community and especially Proverbs is gonna emphasize from our older folks, from our elders, from our forebears in the faith, right? Because this is to teach prudence and knowledge to the young. Wisdom comes to us in our community because it's communal. But it's also communal in another sense. It's communal in the sense of verse three. Verse three says, wisdom is for gaining instruction in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, and equity. I've been convicted these past couple weeks of the amount of selfishness that my journey of wisdom has been about. I feel as though my journey of seeking wisdom and trying to find wisdom has been a very highly individualized thing, even a selfish thing, that if I could just find the right wisdom and gain the right understanding that I might be successful and prosperous and well thought of and a wise person. That's not what Proverbs is about. That's in there, of course, it's great for us to be wise people as individuals, but what is it pointing towards? It's pointing towards righteousness, towards justice, towards equity. Wisdom is about the community. Wisdom is about the community because when we are wise, people flourish. When I'm wise, when you're wise, when he's wise and she's wise, we all come together and we live with the grain of the universe. We live on God's path together and that breeds good things for all. That breeds truth and beauty. Wisdom is communal. And then we hear in verse five and six, In verse five and six it says, let the wise also hear and gain in learning and the discerning acquire skill to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. So here we see that not only is wisdom communal but wisdom is learnable. Wisdom is instruction. We're gonna hear that word in Proverbs a lot. It's about gaining instruction, about gaining knowledge, and that means we need to be teachable. That means we need to have humility to find wisdom. When I was in middle school and involved in athletics before all my teammates got really fast and I got really into musical theater (laughs) because of it, Uh, When I was still playing basketball, I went to a lot of basketball camps every summer, tons of basketball camps, and they would always give out awards at the end of these camps, you know, typical awards like MVP or scoring champion, rebounder, but the award and the metric that I always felt like I had a better chance at, because you didn't have to be all that good, was this most coachable award. There was these awards of of most coachable, most teachable. And it's interesting because we don't normally think of that in itself as something that we prize. We think of that as a means to the ends of success or learning or scoring or winning. But in itself, teachability, coachability is so important because that's the only way we can truly learn. Wisdom requires this kind of coachability, this kind of teachability and openness and humility. 
our subtitle for the series is Wisdom for the Journey. But there's also an aspect that Proverbs is about wisdom, not just for the journey, but wisdom from the journey. That wisdom is this long, long process of walking with people together, of walking with God and remaining open, remaining able to learn and be taught. You know, as Leah mentioned this morning and as we've talked about many times before, it's something of a commonplace today to talk about our divides, our partisanship, and the cultural distance between us all. And as I get to thinking about it, I start to wonder, you know, how many of those divides could really be bridged if each of us approached the other with the assumption that I still have something to learn? What if we all actually approached one another thinking that I still have wisdom to glean from someone else? And not just from my community, but I still have wisdom to glean from the other person, from the other side, from my opponent. I still have something to learn. Because wisdom is learnable even from outside our community. In fact, St. Augustine, in his little book on Christian doctrine, he talks about the way that we can gain knowledge or truth or wisdom from places even outside of Christianity. You know, some Christians, may, we might want to say, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to look at in, any of that possible wisdom. It's, it's just only found right here. But Augustine says, look, wisdom, truth outside of Christianity, it's like the Israelites plundering the gold of the Egyptians. Remember when the Israelites are freed from slavery in Egypt, they're liberated, and on the way out, they take gold and silver. They plunder the gold of the Egyptians. That's what Augustine says our relationship to truth outside of Christianity should be. That if we find wisdom, if we find knowledge in Plato or Nietzsche or whomever, we should plunder that gold. We should take it, and if it's able to be accommodated to Christ, if it's able to be appropriated faithfully on a Christian journey, well, all truth is God's truth. And therefore, we should expect to find wisdom in unlikely places if we only remain teachable to learn it. And then our opening section closes. In verse seven, we end our little prologue to Proverbs here, where he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And here we learn that wisdom is not just communal, it's not only learnable, but wisdom is theological. Wisdom is theological because it begins, this is that primary motto of Proverbs, that we find wisdom in relationship to God. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And we should say right off the bat that this does not mean that God is a moral monster and we should be terrified of him. Absolutely not. In fact, fear in the Old Testament is much more a positive thing Fear is really about reverence, it's about awe, it's even about faith. It's that our posture begins in relationship to God. And yet, we shouldn't totally separate this element of fright. Ellen Davis says, you know, we shouldn't draw too sharp a distinction between how we normally think of fear and the fear of the Lord because she says, look, to experience the full measure of God's power and not to feel some stirring of fear would indicate a profound state of spiritual numbness. One writer I love asked us to write, to imagine walking across a great bridge. Maybe you've driven or walked across some great bridges. We've got some fantastic ones in this country. We've got the Brooklyn Bridge. We've got the Golden Gate, of course. And walking across a great bridge, we can feel confidence. 
We feel trust. We, we can trust that the engineers have done a good job. It's gonna get us to where we need to go. And yet, how many of us, if we peer over the side of that bridge, would not experience the slightest bit of trepidation? How many of us, peering over the side, seeing that vast expanse between the bridge and the water and knowing the depths of the surface of the water to the bottom of the deep, how many of us wouldn't feel a little sense of trembling? That's the fear of the Lord. We have complete trust and confidence in God, this awesome, magnificent power, this incredible God that we can't contain or understand. And yet there's this little sense of, of fear and trembling because we know the depths we know the magnitude. We know we are not even up to the task of understanding God's incredible power and love. And so the point that Proverbs is gonna make over and over and over again is that the starting point of living a good and virtuous life begins with God. It begins with this fear of the Lord. And it's, again, not that God is a moral monster and so we should be terrified. It's the opposite. It's actually that the fear of the Lord keeps us from being moral monsters. How many tragedies, how many historical atrocities could have been altered or avoided if the bad actor, if the perpetrator, had started from the fear of the Lord. The Lord who creates and sustains and upholds us as we walk across this vast expanse of life. The fear of the Lord, the reverence and awe and faith in God is our starting point. And that's why wisdom is theological. And because it's theological, wisdom is relational. Wisdom is relational because Proverbs isn't just this list of rules for living life. It's describing one's position when we realize our relationship to God. It's describing what a good life can look like when we realize our relationship and our position to Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God. Jesus, the, the logos, the word, the rationality of God, the one who comes and shows us wisdom crucified, wisdom resurrected, shows us how to live, how to respond with goodness, with virtue, how to respond with love to our enemies. That is the beginning of a wise life to find our place in our community, to find our openness and our humility, and to find our relationship to the God who holds us up, loves us, and redeems us in Christ. Church, let's stand and praise that God together in song this morning.
it's been wonderful to be with you. To those joining us again on the live stream, we love and miss you and long to see you. We also have a birthday here this morning. Uh, I believe it was yesterday that our very own Lexi Richardson turned 16. Very, very exciting. So good to have you guys with us this morning. And also, I wanted to let you know, if you want to meet with our elders, find Phil, find Paul. They're available for socially distanced prayer and ministry if you need it, as I'm sure many do right now. So, our blessing this morning is that may you go this week walking in the fear of our wise and loving Lord. Go in peace, church.